Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Living the Life Show. I got a very special guest with me today. I got the one and only Mr. Bradley Vincent. Mr. Vincent, how you doing there, sir? I am doing awesome, brother, and uh, thank you for having me, man. I'm of excited course. about the day. Yes, me too. You know, it's funny because I've had an opportunity to just watch you from afar uh, with your just expertise in uh, graphics. And and uh, I mean, I've learned a lot of stuff from watching, even just the overlay I have on the screen right now. I, yeah. uh, you know, I've just watched some of the things that you've done, and I can't even scratch the surface on what you, and you be doing it so simple, like, oh yeah, all you got to do is just do that. I'm like, back up, I can't, <laughs> how did you make that? do that but then i i saw that you also um i don't know if the word specializes is right but you have a calling on your life to help those who are grieving and i when i saw that i was like man i gotta get him on the show uh, on the podcast to so that we can converse and i can learn a little bit about grieving and that we can be a blessing to other people so I pray that after we spend these few moments together, that somebody who watches or listens will be like, man, I needed that. Thank God for Mr. Vincent. And uh, and of course, we'll share all of your contact info in case they need to reach you for more, more information. But before we start the meet, I always mm -hmm. love to get to know my guests a little bit more. So I got a couple questions for you. Are you ready? I am ready. These yeah. you were not prepped for. So, well, actually, we didn't prep for anything. So everything no, we, we talk yeah. about today yeah. is truly from the heart. It's truly what God has placed in your heart to share. And and like I said, the, the, the motive, the goal, the agenda today is to comfort, to help, to be, um, uh, I guess, a shoulder for those who need it today. Amen. Amen. All right. So first question, uh, what's your favorite vegetable? Mm. Broccoli. Broccoli. Ooh. Okay, does it yeah. have to have cheese or can you eat it without cheese? I'm actually a big hot sauce guy. So I make what I call sriracha broccoli. Okay. So oh. I'll microwave it, got the hot sauce and the seasoning on it. Yeah. So hold on. I don't do I don't really you do You just the said cheese, microwave. <laughs> does that count well, as broccoli, folks? All the people out no, no, in the no. world. <laughs> but I steam it. I don't mic I don't nuke it. I, there's a way to do it in your microwave where okay. it steams it. Yeah, All yeah, right. yeah. I don't cook it in the microwave. No. <laughs> I was no. giving out the hang up on you. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. I do, right. <laughs> I do it right. So hot sauce. So do you use hot sauce or do you use sriracha though? Yes. <laughs> Both. I like to sweat. I like to sweat when I eat, man. Oh so, my yeah. goodness! Oh if my. it's hot, I, I'm digging it. So. All right, that sounds good. All right, which Bible character do you feel like you relate to the most? Mm. And tell me why. I would say Job. Mm. Intimately, um, yeah, because I I was doing a deep dive study of Job when my life changed happened through grief. Mm. And I'm glad I had that to bolster me through it. Um, and just the moral premise of Job, the, the book itself, it's mm. not that grieving or hurting or losing means you're going to get a reward at the end. Mm -hmm. It basically means you're just being prepared for the next grief or next loss. Yeah. And uh, taking that real deep dive with Job has actually bolstered uh, my healing journey. Mm. And, you know, God is an on time God. So, that came right at a time of my life, right before my life-changing grief moment happened. Mm. And I'm glad I had that to bolster me. So, yeah, I'd probably say Job. Yeah. So you were reading Job, studying Job before your, your, your um, how did you use it? Life altering. How did, what was the term you used? Well, the, the, my grief moment that changed my life, okay. uh, which was the loss of my four-year-old granddaughter. That's what put me on this journey of healing and also helping others heal through their grief. Because mm. I was in seminary at the time and I was in a deep, deep dive of studying Job. Mm. Um, I actually had committed uh, to I actually memorize several chapters of Job and could recite them. Wow. I mean, deep study of Job, who Job was. You know, who literally wrote the book of Job, what Job was going through and the moral premise of Job and the whole I even wrote, uh, I call it a sermonette, not really a half hour long sermon about Job. Mm -hmm. And right when I was wrapping up those studies, not not even a month later, uh, my granddaughter was gone. Oh, man. And uh, and so I was kind of hawking, hawking back to 
how Job went through that process and um it 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 just it just blessed me. So Yeah. Yeah, and it, it you know, it's interesting that you say that because there's been moments in my life where it'll be either a dream or something you're enduring and you're like, Lord, are you preparing me for something? Cause I'm a little afraid of what this might be preparing me for. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah. and, and like you said, the fact that you had already deep had a deep dive in this, that's what propelled you or helped you to guide you through one of the toughest moments you've had to face, you know? And, yeah. and, and in hindsight, you could praise and honor God that he allowed you to be in that spot. Because who knows how many people in your family you've been able to be a rock for, or at least lead them to the rock of our salvation. Right, right. Um, and in turn, not just your family, but now look at the many people in the world that are going to benefit from, and you hate even saying that, benefit from your hard time. But that that's yeah. the way God God allows us all to because there's no one in this life that's going to go through life without any troubles. Right. You know? And everything that you go through is not I believe is not just for you. Mm. Right. So whatever that is, uh, you could put in a practical sense. Right. I'm learning how to play basketball and be coachable. But then I injure my leg. Mm. Well, I still have all that basketball knowledge. I can use that to help other kids play basketball. Yeah. So it's the same kind of thing in a spiritual sense. Whatever you go through is never just for you. Yeah. It's for your edification than for others that other people might not be able to reach, but mm. you can reach them. Just yeah. like today, right? You And I hate to use the word audience. I'd rather use the word community. But you have a community that many I would never know. Mm-hmm. So... The things we'll discuss today that you are putting in front of your community that I could never reach on my own will bless them. Mm. Right. And so that's how that works. And so that's, you know, I can use that. It can be used to bless others that I never could have reached on my own. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's just those kind of things. I mean, but it, it humanized grief for me. Uh, for, I mean, not to get into the rest of what we're talking about. Yeah. But no, but I, I'd say Job. I'll just leave it. Yeah, leave it with that. Okay. Um, Now, I forget. You're not in Texas, are you? Yes. Texas. Okay. You're not a Cowboys fan, are you? I'm a football fan. I'm kind of a Cowboys fan and a New Orleans Saints fan because I'm originally from Louisiana. Okay. What part of Louisiana? Vivian. Okay, never been there. I I was I used to live in Metairie, Louisiana. I know I know Metairie. Yeah, yeah. Vivian is about as far northwest as you can get. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yep. So you're down south, guy. All right. Yeah, yeah. I'm in Nashville, so um, you know we're not too far from each other. But I'm I'm a diehard anti cowboy person. You know. That's typical. Either you love them or you really hate them. Yeah, I yeah. really do hate them. <laughs> I'm working on that. I'm working on God is working on me. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I wanted to also ask you, what is the best book that you've ever read that you recommend everybody reads? Mm. Other than the Bible, of course. Yeah. I'm an avid reader, but it's not really. I'm not. Re- OK. You know what? The autobiography of B.B. Uh, King, Blues All Around Me. Mm. That's a deep book. I really like that book. You know, his, his, his biography. And I, I like Walter Mosley books, you know, uh, Devil in the Blue Dress, The Yellow Dog, that series of books with the uh, Howard, I mean, uh, Howard Rollins character. Um, now, is that like a detective? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. And now so I, I, I like I like Walter Mosley books, not his science fiction stuff, but yeah. Gotcha. His, uh, yeah, now the BB King <laughs> is mm-hmm. that you said autobiography first, then you say biography. Is it an autobiography? Did he write it or did someone write it for him? No, he didn't write it. He I think it was co written. It's it's okay. been a while since I read it, uh, but it's it's a very powerful book. I I really like it for um because I like stories and I mm-hmm. like, you know, to, to see what made people who they are. Yeah. And I, I really like B.B. King, mm-hmm. you know, so uh, so reading that was good. Yeah. And I always ask my guests that question. That's one of the few that I ask everybody because I like to yeah. learn. I like to learn what good books are out there. And then yeah. sometimes I have found after I speak to a lot of you wonderful people, I go back and I watch or listen to those books or I read those books and I'm like, man, I'm so glad I asked that question. This is a great yeah. book. So I'll be checking out B.B. King. Yeah. 
All right, so let's dive on in. Let's jump into it. Um, I also like to ask each person a little bit about their story and them coming to Christ. What what led to you surrendering your heart to Christ? What what did that look like for you? What's funny about that? I used to be. What is the word? Um, nervous about my testimony, or the word, the proper word is quite frankly ashamed of my testimony because I felt I never really had one. It was more so it was just a natural progression of my life. I mean, I was a lap baby. My mom took me to church all the time. I've been in church as long as I can remember. And it was just that natural progression of I'm in the church. I'm always there. I'm serving. I'm, I love God. And people would call me the feather person versus the brick person. Right. Mm. It didn't take me getting down in the dumps and, Lord save me. It was just a natural progression of, I love the Lord. What is the next step? Mm -hmm. And that was part of immaturity, right? Because you know, through maturity that we're all filthy rags and there's no, no one good. Right. right? And, but I was ashamed of my testimony because I didn't have a story. You know, God didn't pull me out of the mire and take the needle out of my arm. You know, I didn't, you know, I, and so I felt like, my testimony ain't no good for nobody. Mm, yeah. But, you know, so it's uh so I had that that thing about it. But then I realized, no, I just I love God and it was just a natural progression. And uh, I accepted Christ at a fairly young age, preteen, uh, but probably didn't really know I did the right thing or not. You know how mm -hmm. old school church, they line everybody up at the front, put you in those chairs when you raise. OK, uh, what do you have to say, you know, little brother Vincent? And I was like third or fourth in line. So I heard what all the other kids said. Right. So I said, I love the Lord and I want to, you know, I want to be saved because that's what the other kids say it, mm. you know. And so uh went through the process then. But when I got older, I think I really accepted Christ and yeah. for who he was and things like that. And yeah, but it, it's kind of a, you know, not an exciting story. I mean, other than Obviously, my soul is saved and I'm going to heaven. Mm -hmm. That's the excitement mm -hmm. of it. But there's not a lot of backstory. It just felt like it was a natural progression and the, and the next thing to do to get closer to Christ, yeah. to be in the family for real, not just a visitor. Mm. And so uh, once I learned the process of salvation and what that was, I said, I want I want to do that. Right. That's and what so I that, want. That's kind that's of my story, yeah. Want. You know, and, and it's interesting, again, that you said that because I think a lot of us who were brought up in the church and it was, we saw Christ for real in front of us in our families, you do feel kind of, I wouldn't use the word slighted, but you don't feel like your story's big enough, you know? And I, this this is what I, 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 I never forget it. I was at church one Sunday and one of the sisters, she was shouting, she was giving God praise. She's been through some stuff. And I felt so inadequate. I said, Lord, mm. why don't I have that same praise? And I'm going to tell you what God placed in my spirit. He says, you haven't seen what she has seen. So instead of waiting for a big moment to praise me, praise me that I've shielded you from what she's had to endure. And in essence, like you said, I didn't have this big story. I, there's no needle coming out of my arm. But I praise God that because my mom brought me to church and sat me in her lap and I was brought here so often right. that following Christ became a norm for me versus a right. something I had to uh you know, be preached into, it's actually been, I've been being driven that way since my youth. And so now I praise God that I don't have to have yeah. a testimony of that, that he shielded me from that. So that's a, yeah. that's a beautiful thing. And like you said, it's for us to not be ashamed that we don't have that same thunder and lightning, fire and brimstone yeah. type of testimony, but the fact that God shielded me, kept me, and I want to help others to to get to him before they fall into a pit that they never had to fall into yeah but i, I think also I, i'm thinking now on the flip side of that not to thank ourselves too much mm. right because it's like well god didn't have to do that for me so i'm all right it's like no we all are nothing we all are filthy rags everybody has a thing, yes. whatever that thing is, right? So <laughs> yours might not be what we consider 
And that's that's a bad thing we can do too, right? A big sin. Right. No, sin is sin. Right. right? <laughs> and so we're like, well, I didn't have that thing. I no, but you got a thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Everybody got something to be saved from, right? Mm. And so I, I think that we need to make sure we also don't find ourselves minimizing our sin mm-hmm. because we don't see it as a big deal. Right. Right. And so, so we're yeah. not comparing sins in here, huh? Let me see what you Amen. got. Show me your yep. hand. All right. Oh, yep. yeah. I don't do that. At least I don't do that. You know, we find ourselves right. being like the Pharisees. And I thank God I'm not like that man. And God was like, oh, yeah. that man is closer to me than you are. You know, his heart is genuine. He still may struggle and fall into these these traps that the enemy has for him. But his heart is a heart that's after me. You are just playing church still. So right. and I Indeed. haven't given up on you either. You know, right. so, yeah, absolutely. Now we're talking about grief. Mm-hmm. And we're in a situation in our country, especially where it just feels so it's hard. You know, it's hard. People are enduring right now. The families in, in um, Texas after the mass shooting. I mean, I got two sons. You know, I couldn't fathom sending you to school. And now I got to endure every day for the rest of my life. The what ifs, the oh, my goodness. And I'm going to be honest with you, this This conversation between us is going to be such a blessing for me because I struggle. I struggle being around people who are hurting because Mm. I feel I feel inadequate around them because I want to help and I don't know what to do. Did you know that you could actually support the YouTube channel and podcast? That's right. If you have a desire to be a blessing to the show, there's many different ways you can do it. We have Venmo, PayPal, Cash App, and you can use the website to make a donation. Any donation will help and every donation will be used to pour into the lives of others. So if you want to click on the description of this video, you can find all of the information you need to make a donation. God bless you. And thank you for your support. So I think just having this conversation with me and you, it's going to benefit me as well. And especially the community, as you said, I'm going to stop using audience community. Uh, Everyone who's tuning in right now. Listen up because you're about to be blessed with something that will prayerfully you'll never need. But in case you do, you have that that background. So help, help me understand what I can do as a person that wants to be an encourager, but yet doesn't feel adequate. Yeah, I I would say a number one, the ministry of presence goes a long way. Mm. And what I mean by that, just putting yourself in the space with someone that's hurting. Mm. There's no real need for profound words, no real need to try to cheer them up. No real need to be trying to find the right scripture to say the ministry of presence is what's needed Mm. because at its core, grief wants to be witnessed. They want to tell their story to someone. They want someone to be there in their presence. So when they say, my child's not coming home, Mm. they just want somebody to hear that and humanize them in the moment. It's no need to be profound. It's just the ministry of presence. And I I think we all can do that at a level because even in my chaplaincy, I see people at that moment. Mm -hmm. So they've called the police, whatever has happened has happened. And then the police officer might say, would you, do you think you need a chaplain? Or they might ask, do you all have a chaplain? And then a call comes out to me Mm -hmm. and all I get is an address and a little bit of what happened. So I'll show up at a at a house or wherever else, and I'm now Chaplain Vincent showing up into the situation, and I'm not there to give them profound anything. I'm there to be present. And I just tell them, I'm Chaplain Vincent, I'm here, and I just wanna sit with you if you'll allow me to, and if you feel like talking, that's fine, but otherwise, I just, I just came to sit with you and serve you. Mm. And that goes a long way. And so when they start talking about their loved one and start talking about the situation, I'm just there to listen. And I think if we go in with that mindset first, it can help them on their grieving journey. Mm. Just go in because and, and and the thing about it, 
I was that person before my grief moment. I was the, oh, God needed another little flower in this garden and it's going to be all right, you know, and and they're in a better place. No, we don't want to hear that as grievers. We don't. Mm. Um, but I didn't realize that until I was that griever. Yeah. And it was said to me. Mm. And so part of what I want to do is help people before they get there, when they're thinking they're being profound and they're actually honestly piling on and adding more hurt mm. because saved, unsaved, whatever, nobody wants to hear that their loved one is in a better place now, because to me, the best place for my granddaughter is with me. Mm. Now in the spirit, I know she's in a better place, but in my flesh and in my pain, there's no better place for my granddaughter than right here with me. Yeah. yeah. And those parents in Uvalde saved or not, the best place for their children is at their dinner table. Mm. Period. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to meet them there versus saying, oh, they're in a better place now. Rest assured. They don't, they don't want to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let, let's look at it from the flip side. I'm not, I, I don't want to talk. I don't right. want to say anything. I, I don't, I just, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Is it well, important? That I do well, that's the open ministry up. of presence. Yeah, well, that's the ministry of presence, though, right? It's it's you coming in as that caregiver, saying, "I'm just here to sit with you." Mm. And if we sit in silence for 45 minutes, that's what we're gonna do. And we got to be willing to do that. But then I also truly believe that grief wants to be witnessed. Mm. So at some point even the 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 disbelief or the confusion of grief is going to come out in some way and you just need to be there for that mm -hmm. and if you are grieving it's not always mandatory to give your life story every time somebody shows up at the house or ask you you can feel like not talking and it's okay but i also lovingly put a little pressure on people that are grieving too, to be honest with themselves in their grief and stop using this facade of strength, mm. especially with men. It's we have to be able to show the full array of emotions. Mm. Men emote most of their emotions through anger. If I'm angry, I'm angry. If I'm sad, I'm angry. If I'm scared, it all, it, all these things emote as anger. Mm. And we have to be willing as men, because it was something very important that my wife told me early on in our grief. And I was doing the, you know, the strong, silent, go to myself, go cocoon somewhere. And my wife approached me and she said, it's going to be difficult for me to heal if I don't know that you're healing. Wow. And for me to know that you're healing, I got to be witness to some of the things you're dealing with. Don't leave me and go in another room and cry. Mm. Don't leave me and go in another room and throw stuff on the floor. I want to be in there. I want to know that you're hurting. Yeah. And I can't heal unless I know you're going through and you're healing. Mm. And we try to hide things from people that love us. And it's actually hindering their healing. That's the strength the strength in our fragility, the strength in our, I'm hurt, I'm, I'm broken. That's strength. It's not strength to always jump up and run out the room and cry in the shower. And yeah, I mean, there's some healing in that because some, you can't do it all in front of everybody, but there's some, some of that joint pain and showing that I'm going through mm. that actually helps others heal. And so you, there, there's, yeah. Do you think as men, we struggle with that because we're taught from a oh, young yeah. age that, you know, men, we don't cry or men, you know, that you can't show weakness. So grief is of a that, feminine emotion mm. in, in society. Grief is a feminine emotion, period. So how it's do we overcome it's... that stereotype? How do we push past that so that we can as yeah. men, because like your wife said, 
there people are needing us to to come out of this well so they can come out of it well right you know and and society has a role to play but i think house by house man by man relationship by relationship it has to be done because in the midst of losing my granddaughter we're now raising her two brothers at the time she died one was two years old and one was six years old she was four when she died and now we're their guardians um and as a man i had to figure out a way to grieve in front of them in a healthy way so those little boys can see what healthy grieving looks like mm. so when they would walk up to me and they would say paul paul are you thinking about alana right now even if i wasn't i would say yeah i'm thinking about her right now and and i'm sad you know i miss her because i had to realize they were trying to start a conversation about their sister mm. and i would cry in front of them not boohoo slobbing at the mouth passing out to scare them crying but they would see me cry yeah in front of them because they know well if papa can do it because he's hurt i can do it yeah right and it takes man by man it's you know relationship by relationship because we have to at and I, I told a men's group this you can't grieve your ego and your loved one at the same time oh wow you got meaning you, yeah i was gonna say you gotta elaborate yeah. on that well, you, you can't grieve the hit to your manhood and your loved one at the same time. Mm. So because I at a, at a point I was grieving my ability to do the duties of being a man, mm. because we our job is to provide and protect. Right. Mm. And so when something happens to your your child it has now made you less than a man because you didn't do your job whether you were there or not as a man mm -hmm. that's a that's a chink in your armor now now i can spend my time grieving my duty that i feel i didn't do or i can spend my time grieving the loved one that's gone mm. i can't do both at the same time so I decided to grieve my granddaughter versus grieving my manhood and my ego. Mm. You know, wow. the I'm less than a man now because something happened to my granddaughter. I can't grieve that and her at the same time. And as men, we have to make that decision. What are you going to grieve? Because mm. you can't do both at the same time. You just can't. And you can't heal until you finally grieved your love. One. Right. And so that's the thing. And, and men grieve different from women. I even do a whole talk on it, but men grieve different from women in multiple ways. And I always give this scenario. Who would you help? What would you do? And this sums up grief in a nutshell for men and women. I give this analogy. If you saw a man and a woman on the side of the road in a broke down car, all things being equal, who would you stop and help? Everyone to a person says the woman, right? Okay. Second question. If you broke down men and women, what's the first thing that you do? Women almost to a person, grab their phone and call somebody. Men jump out the car and walk <laughs> around it to see if they can figure out how to fix it themselves. Right. That's grief in a nutshell. Wow. So when grief happens and you got a man and a woman, both that have lost a child mm. who does everybody flock to yeah the woman yeah men and women with their grief when they experience grief what's the first thing a man do will we'll do i can do this on my own mm -hmm. i don't need no counseling mm. i don't need nobody from the church messing with me i got it yeah a woman i need my friends around me i need my circle right yeah that's you men's and women's grief in a nutshell that's pregnancy too. You know, I always tease, you know, it's like they always say, How's how's your wife doing? Like, you know, I'm tired too. <laughs> you know, I haven't slept in too much. You know, but everybody's like, they don't think the man, they never think to check on the man. And I'll never forget the first time someone said, How are you doing? 
And I'm like, I mean, I'm fine. You know, it's my wife. Yeah. That's, and they were like, no, I know. And when I when they said it, it almost like it gave me permission to look within and go, you know what? I'm not OK. I am tired. I am overwhelmed just like her because what i'm trying to do is not show her that i'm overwhelmed i'm trying to show her that i i can still stay strong for you and for me and it's like uh that that's that right. ego that you just mentioned so now what well, yep what well, was powerful too and i tell people well and since we're talking about uvalde and things like that and about child loss the further you are away from the birth mother the less support you get. Mm. It, it, it happens over and, and it's not, I won't call it a purely negative thing, but people don't realize they're doing it. Mm. So when a child dies, everyone automatically goes to the mother. The father might get a little bit of how you're doing. Siblings get even less cousins aunts uncles grandparents get even less and less and less mm. so if it's anything i tell people especially what's going on in uvalde right now look to those aunts and uncles and cousins and play cousins and things like that because was one thing that dawned on me the the hispanic mexican culture because I, I i did some spanish classes way way back in the day everyone has a title you know, because in our culture, once you get past brother-in-law, the brother-in-law siblings ain't my ain't my relatives, right? right? In our culture, <laughs> and, I mean, really, they not. Uh -huh. And so, in the Mexican culture, everybody has a title. Because mm. I remember doing that in my uh, Spanish class, and I was like, okay, when I got to brother-in-law, I stopped naming people. They were like, uh-uh, the brother-in-law got a brother, <laughs> and a brother-in-law got a mama and a cousin. I'm like, wait a minute. They're like, oh, no, in our culture, everybody has a title. Mm. So when you think about that in this Uvalde situation, imagine all the people attached to that child yeah. that might not be getting served, right? Yeah. Because and you have multi-generational people, multi-generation you know, people living in the same house mm -hmm. or nearby, especially in a small community like that. And all, all those people outside of that, main dwelling or even past the mother is not even being addressed mm. and that's part of our duty too yeah right just go be in the presence of those others saying oh i, I heard about your cousin i just want to say i'm sorry and you know and if you need someone to walk with you a little bit on this journey i'm here i'm available mm. no pressure whenever you feel like it yeah all right so you know, take take me through a scenario where we're in my home and you've come to sit with me the ministry of presence and i'm telling you i want to talk but i don't know what to say mm -hmm. what what would you what would you do to coach me through that there i'm also what's called SISM trained critical incident stress management when i work with groups that have been through trauma um and part of what I do with that is I don't ask questions. It's almost like a command. So it's almost like, so tell me what happened. So I didn't ask you nothing. Mm -hmm. It's almost like I'm telling you to tell me what happened. I'm asking you if you want to talk mm. or if you feel like talking. And when I say, tell me what happened, you could tell me what happened about anything, that incident, you're, and so it's just it's that opening, right? Mm. But I always intro it with, I'm just here to be present. Mm. Whenever you feel like talking, you know, you can. But then I'll even kind of get into things that are more practical. Because in the grieving community, they have this thing called DEER, D-E-E-R. It's the acronym of things you should do for yourself while grieving to take care of yourself. I created my own that I call DEEPER. Um, but it's basically, I'll start asking them things through that deeper method. So the D is hydrate, drink water, D drink water. So I'll say, Hey, would you like a glass of water? Something like that. Cause I want them to make sure they're hydrated and taking care of themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and I kind of worked, did you eat anything lately? You know, well, I'm not really hungry. It's like, well, you know, um, if you are to get hungry at some point, what kind of stuff do you like? I can make sure somebody has some fruit, 
stuff like that for you, right? And I kind of walked them through that deeper method of practical things, not ever asking them about their grief, mm -hmm. right? But it's that stuff that I want to keep reminding, you know, how have you been sleeping? Well, I'm not sleeping. I say, you know, well, I know when you're going through this, sometimes you can have insomnia. It can be hard to sleep, but getting your rest is important. So I'm mentioning those things that are practical, never really talking about the grief in particular. Right. Um, and I said, you know, I, so I can imagine that, you know, you're you're staying up at night and you know, your sleep can be haphazard right now, especially with all the stuff going on. And and um, and so is there anything that you're trying to plan or work through paperwork that you have to work on that you may need help with. So I kind of talk around it until they're comfortable having just general conversation of stuff that needs to be, they need to be aware of mm -hmm. for their health and for quite honestly, the business of caring for their loved one that's passed away. Mm. Right. And as you kind of talk through that stuff, you know, I have a little card that I have with me of funeral homes and because everybody's not at the church, you know, uh, but I'll ask them if they have a church home or a church family and other folks that I can call for them that they don't feel like calling or just can't call folks no more. They don't want to repeat the story right. over and over and over right. again. And so I'm I'm there for those practical needs. And as they see, I'm there to meet those practical needs. The conversation tends to kind of, you know, well, I don't want to tell nobody no more what happened, you know, what happened to my wife, you know, and I was like, I can understand that, sir. You know, um, well, tell me about her. And there we go. Mm. Oh, we were married for 65 years. And, you know, and because my first call I go to, you know, you always remember your first call. These people were married long than I've been alive. Wow. And so I'm there feeling inadequate to speak into this man's life mm. about the loss of his wife. They've been married almost as long as my parents been alive. Mm. And, and so I'm trying to speak into this man. And so at first he didn't have nothing to say, didn't want to say nothing to me. And I just stood in the corner. And then all of a sudden he walks over, starts talking about his life with his wife and all the things they did. And she promised not to leave me. And I'm like, well, and so I kind of walked him through that, you know, it's, and they were believers. And I was like, you know, when you get the call, we all have to answer. And so I'm sure if your wife had a choice to stay here with you, she would, you know, but, you know, and you were telling me that she's been ill for a while and um, she held on as long as she could, I'm sure, you know, but, you know, and so you kind of walk them through it, you know, mm -hmm. and just have that conversation and be available. But he did 85% of the talking. Yeah. You know, but then I made sure I said, Hey, you know, yeah. And you, you're pacing a lot and then that might be how you cope. But I just want to make sure that, you know, if you get a little tired, you know, come have a seat, let's, let's sit down and talk a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. Then he'd sit down and he'd jump back up, start pacing. And that's fine too. Mm -hmm. You let them kind of work through what they need. Cause at some point I'm not going to be at that house with him. And so you have to let them get into their own healthy coping mechanisms, whatever that is, and not, not put a not put reins on anything that they're doing that's healthy mm. now everyone used, is an expert of their own grief you know yeah you've used that word healthy several times and i just wanted to get a better understanding when you say mm -hmm. healthy grief what do you mean by that i think at a at a, at a deeper level beyond children you know all, us, us of maturity we know what healthy is right so i mean and Quite frankly, what if, if you drink a couple of beers on a regular basis, that's your thing on a weekend, you're watching a football game, you drink a couple of beers, and then that's still what you do, that's cool. But now you're drinking two six packs a day, mm. that's unhealthy. You self-medicating, you know that's unhealthy. So we know what's healthy and what's not, right? Mm -hmm. The grief... The, the journey of grief naturally takes you towards healing naturally. If you lean into it and let grief do what grief does, it naturally takes you towards healing, trying to stop it, trying not to grieve, doing things that you know that you wouldn't do if your loved one was alive. Right. And so 
you know what's healthy and what's not. And I tell folks, that, you know, and men are really bad at it, quite frankly, because we ideate on death. We start to do reckless behavior. Now, all of a sudden, I want to start skydiving mm. and driving a race car. It's like, I ain't never done that. <laughs> and now that my wife passed away, I'm going to start running with the bulls mm. and I'm going to start, sky, you know, jumping off of cliffs because I'm I'm now trying to be close to death, but not die. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Wow. Unhealthy. Yeah. Um, I stopped taking care of myself and men do this a lot. If um, if you're a man out there and you've had a recent and I hate to call them recent grief events, like it's something like a football game, but you've had recent grief in your life. You need to go get your man checkup in six months. Because quite frankly, when my granddaughter passed away, I lost track of time. Mm -hmm. I did. And a year goes by, whatever, however long goes by. And I finally kind of come out the fog a little bit and I go have my man check up and I'm jacked up. Prostate jacked up, this jacked up, that jacked up. And because my mind wasn't right, I don't know if I had those issues before she died. I mean, mm -hmm. I was just... I was just messed up. Yeah. And and I truly believe that when you have those spiritual pains and other kind of pains, they can turn into physical stuff. And when, especially when you're holding on to your grief mm. and trying not to grieve and this, you're internalizing all that stuff that needs to flow through you. And I tell men all the time, you can't fix enough cars. You can't build enough bird houses. You can't play enough golf not to grieve. Mm. You're going to grieve. Grieve is going to take its time, not like slowly take time, but grief is going to snatch that time. It's going to take its time. And one day you're going to be sitting up at your job and just lose it. Yeah. Because grief is like, you've been holding me too long. I got to do what I'm going to do. And here I come. Wow. And so it's best to lean into it and let it take you naturally where it takes you, which is towards healing, I believe. Mm, that's beautiful. It's beautiful. So, and again, and this is helping me to, I guess, appreciate that it's the process you have to endure anyway. So why fight it? Now, from a, a believer's standpoint, I'd like to get your, your, your ideas on this. How do I keep from blaming God? You know, because I remember when you you just mentioned about Job, how do I keep my heart from blaming God in this most dreadful situation that I'm enduring? Well, I'll, I'll say that in a couple of ways. Um, in the midst of my early grief, I felt all I had was sad talk for God, mm. as if if all I got is sad talk for God, he don't want to hear it. Right. But God has seen and heard it all. And I had to kind of come out of my shell with that. Like I need to lament before God and let him know how I'm hurting and let him know that I wish it wasn't this way. And why, 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 what could have been different and why her and why all this? I had to release that to God. But on the second part of that, and as you mentioned, Joe, you can be upset with people you have relationship with. Mm hmm. And so when we think we got to have kid gloves on around God, we're minimizing God to our level. Mm. God didn't heard people be mad at him before, <laughs> you know, and you've been mad at your spouse before you've been mad at your kids before. And it didn't break. We know what will break a relationship. Right. And being upset at somebody doesn't break a relationship. That's something you're going through. Mm. And I went through that with God, not necessarily anger. It wasn't, it wasn't anger. It was more, I felt, um, you know how you feel like why me and the God will say, why not you mm. kind of thing. Yeah. And I, I remember vividly, man, it, it, it was as clear as you and I are talking right now. We had made arrangements for my granddaughter's funeral and we were driving back. I think we we're driving towards East Texas, either to take my mom home or we we're going back toward the hotel. And as clear as day, God asked me, 
if I asked you, when would be the best time to have Alana back with me? What would you say? And in my mind, I was saying, I, I don't know, God. I don't. Then he said, well, when she was 50, when she was 100, how about after you died? And I'm like thinking, yeah, God, that'd be best because I wouldn't be going through this. And God said, if I asked you, when would be the best time to have Alana back with me? You would say no time, wouldn't you? And I said, yes, God, I would. And he said, that's why I didn't ask you. Mm. And when I tell that to some people, they think, wow, God went off on you like that. But then I had to see the wisdom of God and who he is. And Alana was is very special to me but all people are special to god and he's no respecter of persons at that level by title or whatever else and we're in a fallen world and things happen Mm. yeah could could god had done whatever he done and pushed the door closed here or there or made the seat belt not unbuckled yeah he could have did all that but we're in a fallen world and and people make mistakes and things happen yeah and it it soothed me at a level. It didn't stop me from missing her. It didn't stop the ache. But it soothed me through that moment that I had a relationship with God where he could talk to me like that and knew I would understand him and basically open the door for me to even lament before him, you know, and be angry at other people, but not break those relationships either. Mm. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I, I'm okay with people lamenting and being angry at God. Mm -hmm. You get angry with people you are in relationship with. It happens because those that are closest to us are those that get the shrapnel first (laughs) when something blows up. Mm. And if you close to God, he going to catch some. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and so like you, you said, he's prepared for it. It's like it doesn't diminish him being God because you're uh, right. not able to process the, your current situation. Yeah. You know, and I think what you said, it was be- a beautiful illustration or a beautiful moment you had with God. Well, when when if it was up to you, when would you say I could bring her? You would never say I could bring her, you know, and and. I can't consult you on certain situations because if I show you my whole plan for your life, you will dispute 80 percent of it because it doesn't fall in line with what you think should happen. But you say you trust me. And if you trust me and you know, I have nothing but the greatest plans for you, according to Jeremiah, the plans for your future, for you to prosper trust it and like you said the hardest part is probably for all of us to stop saying like you said trust god god's got a plan this was in his plan his plans are bigger than our plans those are not the things that people want to hear in that moment now we'll grow eventually to a point yeah. where we can hear those things and, and it's so beautiful that you said job you studied job because even when job's friends came they just sat with him and they i can't remember off the top man was it was it three days that they just sat and no one? Spoke? Yeah, it, it was. It was a good period of time, close to a week. They sat, with, but then they got tired of sitting mm. and, and started start speculating. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so Look, Job, we, you had we to have done yeah. something. I mean, God just don't do stuff like this. Yeah. It's like you know, and and it's kind of it, just to go back to what you were saying about how God says I couldn't consult you on this. And um, I think it was when God was talking to Moses and Moses had the excuse of, you know, I can't even speak well. Why would you send me? And God said, who made your mouth? I made your mouth. And if I tell you to go do something or if I put this in motion or allowed it to happen, I've got the end in mind as well. You know, the end is already sealed. So trust me, as my dad preached a sermon one time, he called it managing the middle. Oh, you got to You know, the beginning. You know the end if you're in the Lord. All you got to do is manage the middle. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, it's just just thinking of, of as it relates to grief, you wonder, when is this ever going to let me go? Like, when is it going to finally, like, because it's heavy. I know he, people say time heals all wounds. When's it going to mm-hmm. let me go a little bit? He, 
And I'll say this because as I've matured through my grief, I remember early on and I actually, I see, I've seen my progression with even working with people through grief. Mm -hmm. And early on, I would use this term, always healing, I-N-G, never healed, E-D, on this side of eternity. Mm. And I was doing, I was saying that over and over and, you know, kind of giving people that freedom, that uh, freedom, so to speak, that you're going to always be dealing with this and what, you know, this kind of thing. And I was listening to a sermon and it, it, it touched my heart. I'm glad that God had me watching that sermon. And I realized I wasn't giving, I wasn't allowing God to heal me. Cause I kept saying healing never mm. healed. Mm. And what I realized with that, and I always knew it, but that sermon brought it home for me. He was featured on a whole different topic, but this is what I got from it. God made my granddaughter. So when she passed away and left that void in me, God knows the exact size of that void. Mm -hmm. But I had made the decision by saying healing never healed. I made the decision not to ever let God touch that. Wow. And wow. I kept saying, I'm always, I'm always going to have this void. I'm always healing. I won't be healed until I get to glory. Mm. I, this is just something I got. And, and I realized just like salvation, God ain't going to make you take it. So I had to release and say, God touched that spot too. Mm. Cause he knows exactly what it takes to fill that spot. Cause he created the person that used to fill it. Right now, just like anything else. And I show people this little scar on my wrist here and stuff like that. My arm is healed from my bone being broken and poking out of my arm, but there's a scar there. That's evidence of work being done. Mm -hmm. So God can, if I let God have that void, he will fill it. But the scar of the surgery is a showing that I had a void there. Mm -hmm. So I'm always going to carry that scar. It might itch, it might tingle. And that's you thinking about that loved one, but you can allow God to heal it. Yeah. Right. And we're all an accumulation of our scars. Mm -hmm. That's what we are. And so. I think it's possible for it to be healed with a scar or the wound that we're going to always carry, but we have to give God access to it. And I don't necessarily think that we're in charge of how long we grieve, but I think we're a little bit of in charge of the intensity and perhaps some of the length of how we grieve by how much of it we release and give to God to help us with it. Mm -hmm. And that's not, leaving my loved one behind and moving on. It's me moving forward, carrying that grief with me. Because I think a lot of us are like, if I heal, that's like I never loved them. That's a lie. Wow. We can heal and still carry them with us. Because I tell folks this, it's like, if I fell off a bicycle and broke my leg, how long should I wait before I go to the doctor? Everybody like, you need to go immediately. Okay. So you have a loved one that died and broke your heart. Mm. How long are you going to wait to go get that taken care of? <laughs> right. It's, it's, so it's, 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 I'm telling you, it's so profound yet so simple. And, and I, I, I am, I'm honored that God has placed me in rooms and places to help people with their grief. But like we talked about the lament and the anger and stuff like that, I'd rather for God not have put it on my heart the way he did. Mm -hmm. I'd rather, because when people say, oh, Brother Vince, we appreciate it so much. This is so great. And I'm like, thank y'all, but I'd rather have my granddaughter. Right. And that's still how I feel. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, and that, that's, that would be the reasonable feeling. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm so grateful that I've been able to be of service to you. But what I had to endure to be able to bless you with this, I, I it ain't something I'm I'm super grateful for, you right. know. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of that honesty in ministry and 
God knows how I feel about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cause it's like when we pray, right? We say, amen. Amen means I agree. Mm -hmm. Cause God already knows what you're calling him for. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's just, and so he knows I, I'm thankful I'm, I'm, I'm able to help people in this way, but he knows I trade all this stuff in to have my granddaughter knock on this door right now mm -hmm. and come in here and yeah. sit in my lap. Man. And so that's just where that is, you know? Yeah. Now, underneath your picture there, it says the grieve coach. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. How did that come about? Yeah, I mean, I'm a big acronym kind of guy. And because uh, <laughs> I want to have people have easy ways to remember stuff. And, you know, you got grief coaches, grief counselors, this, that, whatever. And I'm like, well, but I think what we actually do is we grieve. We don't grief, we grieve. Mm. And so I was kind of thinking of how can I help people go through their journey and give them pointers or a process to just kind of help them lead them through. And so I, call, I figured out this acronym called grieve and I call myself the grieve coach. So the G is have grace for those that are not grieving. Mm. And that helps us fend off that anger. Cause I had that early on. How dare you be on the freeway with me right now? Don't you know my granddaughter's dead? How dare you be in the grocery store? Don't you know my granddaughter's dead? Mm. And them people don't know nothing about my granddaughter. Right. But I was angry with people that weren't grieving my grief. Mm -hmm. So that G, we need to put that up top. Have grace for people that are not grieving because they just don't know. Right. Or you got to relinquish control. You got to say, God. I need your help with this and God or myself, I wasn't in control of what happened. I don't have control of a life and death like that. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost an admittance that you're not in control of everything. And in a way that's freeing and it can be a little scary too, but it's true. You don't have control. <laughs> I don't have control of this chair falling from under me. Right. I don't have control of, of this ring light staying on. I turned it on, but I don't know if it's going to stay on. I ain't got no control over that. You know, <laughs> the bulb could just go out. Right. You know, and so we have to relinquish control. I invest in your healing, both financially and time if needed. Go get counseling, buy some books. Then find, put yourself in spaces where you can get help through counseling, through groups, your church, things like that. Great investment will be connecting with this guy named Bradley Vincent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, man, and I love to walk with people as much as I can. And then the E, express yourself. Emote your grief. Now, some people, you can, I mean, through journaling, through doing art, through talking to people, but you got to, you got to express it. Mm. Now, put a caveat here. Do not use your grief as an excuse to treat people bad. Mm. Because I'm grieving, I treat everybody else like dirt because I'm hurt. I need to make sure everybody else hurt. That's not what I mean. Yeah. Right. And I, I because because I grieve, I give tough love to other grievers. And it's like, we can't do that to people, especially with that grace thing, too, because you, people are not grieving your loss. And that's not their fault. Mm -hmm. Their life is still moving on. Yeah. Their world is still spinning. And had it not been for your grief, your world would still be spinning too. So you got to be cognizant of that. And then the V, and I tell folks this all the time, it's like you have to visualize your healing. And I, I know some people might see that as kind of mumbo jumbo. But even early on in my grief, I was intensely grieving. I wasn't sad. I was grieving mm -hmm. and sad was up the mountain from where I was. But I saw that spot on the mountain and I was like, God, when I can get there and just be sad. And now it's God, when I can get there and be okay around her birthday and around the month of May. Mm-hmm. And God, one day I'm, I'm going to be all right. I know I will. But you got to visualize that. 
want that, not wallow in your grief. Visualize your healing. Mm. Visualize sad. If you can't even get the sad right now and you can't get up out of bed or get out your closet from laying on the floor, moaning and groaning, just visualize sad. Right. And you got to get there. Mm -hmm. And then finally, engage with other people that are on the journey. Find a group of people you're comfortable with. And I, I tell people this, too. One of the things that a lot of grievers say is that, well, you know, grief will change your address book. You got people that will just leave you behind and won't talk to you no more and they just desert you. And this is just something I learned in my grief and it might not work for everybody. But and this is for grievers to think about. If you have that play cousin, that brother that was tight with you, I mean, they've been through it with you. And then you had your grief moment and they seem to have disappeared. I think in a lot of those cases, that person is just grieving who you used to be before your grief. Wow. And they don't even know how to how to relate to you anymore. Hmm. And so I try to empower people that are grieving, even though you feel like they should be serving me, they should be caring for me right now. Pick up that phone and call some of those people and just say, hey, brother, we hadn't talked in a while since my granddaughter passed away and I miss you. I want to know how you feel. Mm. I, I know it's probably been hard because I, I stopped playing golf and, you know, I, I just, you know, and it's, it's been hard for me, but it's harder because I don't have you in my life. And as a griever, we have to stop thinking that everybody should be caring for us. We still have a responsibility because they loved you. Your loss affects them. Maybe not the same way, but I'm a different guy now. From May 10th to May 11th, I changed. Mm. And oddly enough, there's even a picture I had on Facebook on May 10th, the day before my granddaughter died. I was helping unload a truck at a at a humanitarian aid warehouse that had supplies in it for orphan children. And me and the guy unloading the truck took a picture and I was like, this is what ministry is. I love doing this. The next morning, my granddaughter was gone. Mm. The dude in that picture from the from May 10th doesn't exist anymore. I haven't been back to that warehouse since that day. I couldn't, t I couldn't make myself go back mm. um, for years. I think I finally went back about three months ago and it's been six years. Wow. I, I, cause all the things you did right before that moment are now alien to you. And all it does is tie to that moment, you know, and, I had to go back to work. I had to go back to the parking garage and all that stuff. But places that I had a choice not to go back to, cold turkey, stop going. Mm. Now, is and, that is that something you do because it it like it makes it a fresh again? It makes it a new. So yeah. I avoid that because I don't want to be reminded of this again. I don't want to be reminded of what I was doing the day before she died. Gotcha. Um, I remember. Cause your body remembers, mm -hmm. even if you don't, if, even if you don't think you, your body knows because the morning she died, I got the call at the office and I rushed, get in the car, parking garage, go home, get my wife. Then we rushed to Louisiana. And after that, I didn't return to work for a few weeks until after her funeral. I go back to work the first day. I'm kind of zombified when really talking to people. But I get in my car to go home and my body remembered going circular down that parking garage. Mm. And I had to pull over and I cried for 15 minutes because that's the last memory my body had after I got the call that my granddaughter died is going out that parking garage. Mm. Now, the first time I did it, I was oblivious. So I was trying to get home to my wife. Cause I, I gotta, I gotta get to my wife. We gotta figure out what happened. We got, we gotta get this. But when all the dust settled and I'm back at work now, my body remembered mm. getting in that car. And the last time you did this, 
you were going to get your wife because your granddaughter died and I lost it. And so, but those are the triggers, but they're, they're all natural and healthy. Mm. And you have to lean into those and work your way through them. Yeah. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't quit my job. I couldn't stop parking that parking garage. That's the only place we had to park. And so every day I was just re-traumatizing myself until I had to tell grief, you know what? I got to get home. I got to see, so I can't keep crying every day. Okay, grief, when I get home, <laughs> I'm going to give you your time, but I got to get home. Mm. I can't sit in this parking garage every day, extra 20 minutes and cry. Just let me get home, grief, and then I'll deal with you when I get home. Because you still got to go buy groceries. You still got to go to the dry cleaners. You still got to do life. Yeah. And so sometimes you got to tell grief, okay, grief, just let me do the grocery store and I'll get home and we'll have our time later. You know? Mm. Um, and that's part of the process. Uh, when we first went, I mean, not to be legal to store and everything, but I was, you know, but um, there's just, because I want to, I want to tell people that it's, it's natural. You love much. You're going to grieve much. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're going to deal with these things and you're going to go through this and um, just want to normalize it. And there's nothing to be avoided, nothing to shy away from and lean into it. Let grief do what grief does. Um, but you still got to live too. you still, you still got life. You got chores to do. You got places to go. And that's not denying your grief. That's just you saying, I got to give grief its time later. I have to buy groceries right now. I have to, because mm. we got to eat. Yeah. Know? And so you have to work your way through it. Yeah. Man, this has been absolutely wonderful. I truly, uh, again, I, when I just said that, I thought about what you said a moment ago, how people tell you, brother Vincent, this is exactly what we needed. <laughs> and, and, but it is, it is beautiful how, your gift of helping others through this, it seems as though it's so fluid for you. It's easy. Mm -hmm. And you're sharing what you've shared today. I will probably watch this video at least three or four more times. And because I know it's life, I'm going to find myself in a moment where I'm going to have to be grieving as well. I'll probably go back and watch this again to get me through those moments, to remind myself what you were just sharing with the grieve coach. That was, that, that is a beautiful acronym. I mean, what you put together, your program, your, your plan and, and how you coach people through these things and walk along with them. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. I so that. I, um, I, you know, I commend you and you are definitely doing what God need you to do. You know what I'm saying? And it's, it's, it was a blessing to me, tremendous blessing. And like I said from the outset, I pray that our conversation will be a blessing to many. I can tell you right now that's going to be the case. You know, that's going to be Amen. the case. So is there anything that you would like to share with the community um, as it relates to if they needed to reach you? I know I've shared your credentials on the screen, but if there's anything that I haven't shared that, you know, they could reach out to you in case they needed you. They can utilize your services, things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, uh, dropping by my website, it's just BradleyVinson.com, my name.com. There's some free resources there. I have a little ebook there that they can download. Uh, it's called Good Grief, Why Believers Can Grieve with Hope. And it digs a little bit deeper about um, the grieving process that I'm going through and how as believers, you know, it's, it's all right to grieve and um, how to do that in a healthy way. And I'm, I'm just available to anyone that's willing to let me walk some of this journey with them. However long that part of it is, I just wanna be available to people and uh, just be a blessing as I still learn on my journey to just give people some road marks or landmarks along their journey. So just wanna be available. And yeah, so you can find me on Instagram and on Twitter and. Just come to BradleyVinson.com, reach out to me by email, and I'd just love to talk to you, you know, and spend a little time and see if we can help you on your journey. Outstanding. Beautiful. Again, thank you again. Um, 
I, this was definitely well worth the wait of us connecting. I truly appreciate your time. Truly Thank appreciate you, it. All right, good people. Another show in the books. This is probably going to go down as one of my all time favorites. And I pray that you are blessed and uh, that you will share this with someone else. Encourage someone else. There's someone in your life right now that needs to hear, to see this conversation, because as Brother Vincent has laid it out for us, this 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 is going to get us through a lot in our lives. So I pray that you guys will share it with someone else. And don't forget to subscribe and share um, the channel and the podcast with someone that you love. All right, you've watched it. Now I want you to share it. But most importantly, I want you to live it. So let's get busy living the life.